Bismillah ar-Rahman. We keep this section a bit really short. I appreciate it's been a long session. I'm gonna get, inshallah, it's gonna conclude the salah. And then if you guys have any questions, we'll finish off. Right. Now the, now the second part, uh, the, the, the second part here, I'll, I'll just give you a quick example of a surah. We haven't got time to discuss the surah. Inshallah, if you guys have an opportunity or you get some people, I'd be more than happy to do the full on course with the course material and stuff. Uh, but just take, for example, most likely we pray surah ikhlas, right? Uh, the, the takeaway surah is wal asr and inna atayna and ikhlas. Ironically, the wal asr is actually talking about time and how we don't take advantage of time. And we pray that surah in our salah to save time. But ikhlas, take for example ikhlas, like the whole purpose of ikhlas. Beautiful. Allah Allah had say he is one. Allah is Samad. Allah is independent, self-sufficient. Lam yalid wa lam yulad. God cannot be given birth to. No, can a, God doesn't give birth. No, can anybody give birth to a God. Wala mi kulla hu kufu wa ahad. And there's nobody like Allah. There's nobody like Allah. There's nobody comparable to Allah. Uh, the whole, why are you saying this in your salah? You know the beautiful thing in our prayer? And, and a lot of people, before, are like, your spiritual diet is like your, 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 like your physical diet. Right? Sometimes when you're on the same kind of cross train now, on the, on the treadmill, it gets kind of tedious and boring at times. In fact, your, your muscles physiologically also create a resistance. Right? So you need to do more of a workout to get the same kind of effect that you usually want. What happens in our salah, the same thing. We pray the same surahs over and over again. It kind of gets stale. It becomes monotonous, routine, and we kind of feel disconnected. And the beauty of Salah, my favorite thing about Salah, is that you can pray anything from the Quran in your Salah. There's no reason for it to be boring. And so instead of just praying the, like, the same surahs over and over again, when it kind of gets boring, it, mix it up. Mix it up. Right? So in your Salah, you can pray three short ayats. Yaseen wal Quran al Hakim al Muslim. That's one, that's enough. Many, bare minimum, I'm saying. Any three ayats from the Quran. Is, is, is permissible for it to be classed as a rakah in your, in your prayer. So mix it up. Minimum three. You can pray as much as you want. Instead of praying the same stuff. And what you are reciting, understand it. So for example, when Allah is saying, like this is so relevant for us at Easter time. Right? No one can give birth to a God. I mean, Jesus is not the son of God. Right? A God doesn't give birth to somebody. And a God who they believe Jesus to be God cannot be given birth to by someone. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is unique. You pray all these different surahs, it just gets more amazing and more amazing. And there's so much to discuss. Right. You know, some of the surahs, some... some I'll, I'll give you the points at the end, inshallah, what I want like to guess today. Right, so you pray your surah, whichever surah you wanted to pray. Normally in the full day course, we go through ikhlas, falak and nas in detail. But we'll, inshallah, just skip the surah a bit. Now, after you prayed your surah, then you go into ruku. Right, so in ruku is actually the, the we be bowing to God in reverence, in awe of God, before we prostrate to Him. So here we we strike the word Subhan Rabbi Al Azim. Now, now I'll explain what Subhan actually means. The word Subhan, because in the Quran, as I said earlier, when the Christians say that God has taken a son, Allah gives not like a one liner; He gives you one word response, literally, Subhanak. That's what Allah says. When people say Allah has a son, God says Subhanallah, which we translate as glory, but we really means the word seen, baha, sabaha, has different meanings. One of its meanings is وَكُلٌّ فِي فَلَكٍ يَسْبَحُونَ Allah uses word in Surah Yasin that everything flows in its own orbit. That's one of the meanings, something flowing. The, another word of sabaha means something that is high in position and it's beyond what's below it. It's something which is so perfect that it's totally free from anything that it's associated to it. That's the meaning. Something which is so pure in its own entity, it's above something else, that it's free from anything that people can associate it to it. Why is Allah using this word? This is because people are saying, God has a son. So Allah is saying, Subhanak, Allah is free from anything we associate to God, including a son or anything. Anything that you think is an equal to Allah. Allah is exalted. Allah is beyond what you equate Him to. That's what the word subhanAllah actually means. And then you're saying subhana rabbi, meaning this here is Ya'i Mansub, meaning my Allah, my nourisher, my sustainer. The word, same word Rabbi used earlier. The one who's, who's looking after everything for it to grow and for it to be plentiful. Subhana rabbi al adim Now the word adim the word Ain, Dad, Mim, from the word Adam, which means bones. 
right? The skeletal system gives, gives support and structure to the rest of the body. And here is that when you add the word adeem, it creates more like a hyperbole. That Allah is the one who is giving structure and order to everything around us. And what's amazing, simple translation is means somebody who's great, but somebody who gives nidam, somebody who gives order and structure to everything. The one who's orchestrating everything that's around us. Now you're saying this in the most unstable position, which is amazing. You're saying this in the most unstable position. You're in ruku, and even if a child pushes you over, you fall over, and whilst you are unstable, you're reflecting God's stability. That's a correlation between what you're saying and where you are and what you're doing, and recognizing, and you're actually bowing. Literally, you're saying, you know, I'm putting my head down, and I'm recognizing how amazing you are. And when you talk about God's greatness, and the fact that He gives structure and order to everything, I'll give you a few quick examples. The from the Quran, chapter 56, Waqi'ah, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala talks about the most basic things for us to appreciate and understand. Why well, I talk about spiritual intelligence. It's a branch of psychology, spiritual intelligence. Where as human beings, we draw meaning from everything that's around us. That's what a believer is. You know, you're not just living, you don't just exist, but you're living life. Like you, you're, so, you, you're so aware and cognizant of everything. Everything has meaning for you. Wherever, even the most smallest of things. Whether it's timing the children, whether it's going for a walk, whether it's looking at creation, being reflective. So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala talks about uh, afaritum. Tell me for example, ma tum noon, right? The sperm human beings are created from. Antum nahnu khaliqun. Do you create ch- children or do we? Meaning it does Allah. Humans engage in a simple action of procreation. And we think because of our ingenuity that we are responsible. Mother does give birth. But who allows? In Surah Ali Imran, Allah says He's the one who fashions, sculpts the child in the womb of the mother. He, he's Musabir. Allah Allah's given you the features that you have. Right? Allah says then, Allah gives you proportional limbs, faculty of understanding, cognitive ability to process information, everything God's given you. Allah says, Tell me about Ma'aladi Tashrabu, tell me about the water that you drink. Allah is the one who's creating structure to everything that's around us. Now I'm giving you some examples. Tell me about the water you drink. Do you cause the water to descend from the laden clouds, from the heavy clouds, or do we? There's Allah. He's the one who's pulling the strings, right? Through the process of evaporation, 70% plus of the earth is water, and it, and it, condense, and, and it, and it ascends in high altitude as it's, as it's evaporating. And then, as it reaches a high altitude because of the cold, it condenses into clouds. And Allah is in full control of these clouds. Allah then instructs the winds to blow this cloud to the exact GPS location. Then through the process of precipitation, water droplets come down and you have fresh water to drink. If, we, if Allah says, if Allah wanted to punish you or any one of us, I mean, He would just take water away from us and you would cease to exist. Some of you have seen sea water, which is salty. You drink it, you die. Right? For the idea, when the Prophet would make drink water, he has a beautiful du'a. Du'as are not just said like a parrot fashion. Like you're supposed to think of what you're saying, like salah. So, Messenger, Alhamdulillah, Well, praise belongs to Allah who gave me sweet water to drink. And He did not make this water bitter because of my sins. If Allah wants to punish me, He take this water away from me. Vegetation, plantation, animals, everything will cease to exist. We as human beings would become instinct. And Allah is the one who's the Adeem, He is the one who creates Nidam, He creates the structure and order of everything that's around us. And we're saying that to Allah because He's the Rabb, the nourish and sustainer, and is free from anything humans can associate to Him. That's what you're thinking about whilst in Ruku. Three times, five times, seven times, say it. Any other time you want to say it. Right? Reflecting, thinking, thinking about God's greatness about this. And then you stand up. Allah listens to the one who praises him. Allah listens to the one who praises him. Rabbana lakal hamd. The whole law for you belongs all praise and thanks. Such a beautiful part. I bow down to, I bow down, I mean, I've, I've done ruku and I'm coming up. Allah, you listen to the one who praises you. And Allah, I'm praising you. And then you fall into prostration. Right? I read something which is so beautiful and profound. Ibn Arabi mentions that. You know, your sujood is so beautiful. It's the closest a believer can be to Allah. That you whisper into the grounds and it can be heard in the heavens. What you say. 
So you're saying, Subhana Rabbi Al-A'la, the same thing, SubhanAllah. Allah is free from anything humans can ever associate to Him. He's exalted, high. Rabbi, my Allah. A'la literally means the highest. Free from anything and He's the, at the highest. Meaning he's the, mo- he's the focal point of my life. He's the most important being. He's the one who's the most powerful. And you're saying this in sujood. And the the Prophet, would, after saying this, he would make a dua. He would make dua in sujood. Rabbi ghfir li warhamni. Oh Allah, please forgive me and have mercy upon me. Oh Allah, please forgive me and have mercy on me. Rabbi ghfir li warhamni. In terms of the fiqh side of things, I'm the Shafi, I have more lenient opinions, you can do this in fard. The Hanifi understanding is you don't do it in your fard, then you do it in your sunnahs and nawafil. But if you want to do it, it's fine. It's not very good, much of an issue. And you're doing that twice in between your frustrations. Now in your second rakah, you're going into the tahiyyah. I'm keeping this brief of, because of time. You're now in your tahiyyah. This is again, which is a beautiful part of our salah, which we don't appreciate. Now there are so many different narrations of how the tahiyyah is actually prayed. Right? The Messenger of Allah, Ibn Abbas mentions, that the Messenger of Allah taught him how to recite the tahiyyah in the salah, like how he would teach us parts of the Qur'an. And he mentions this hadith, where the Messenger of Allah actually grabbed him by his hands. He, like, his hand was in the middle and the Prophet like, sandwiched his hands with his two hands like this. Made him sit down, like, grabbed him, made him sit down and taught him the tahiyyah directly. And then he, men- he taught it to his student, his student, and his student. Musalsa bil awali is called. A hadith is sometimes narrated where the Prophet taught him in a particular way and that same way that the person has been taught has been passed on. So when we learn this hadith from our star, he actually grabbed us by the hand, made us sit down and taught us word by word. Even though we knew it, but because of the hadith, because of the Prophet then. You have this kind of hadith. It is a hadith where the Prophet would only have uh, dates and water. So this is a hadith where the Messenger of Allah talks about iftar. So when this hadith is reported, you do the same thing. But the Messenger of taught him this. So what does it mean? There were about five to seven different narrations. In Tirmidhi and Tuffet al ahbudi he talks about all the different narrations. So sometimes you may have a variation of the tahiyyah, which is absolutely fine. There's no like, this is right, this is wrong. Different variations are used and taught by the Messenger of Allah himself. And they've been authenticated. But the most common one we pray, at tahiyyah to lillahi wa salawat wa tayyibat. Right. I'll give you a quick translation. Tahiyyah means greeting. In the Quran, Allah uses this word. وَإِذَا حُيِّتُمْ بِتَحِيِّتٍ فَحَيُّ بِأَحْسَنِ مِنْهَا أَرُدُّهَا When somebody greets you, respond to that greeting or respond in a better way. Meaning, say, somebody says, Salam, you say, Wa alaykum salam wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. So we, we, we greeting God. Now, this troubled one tabi'i, Abdullah al-Ajli, right? Like, what does it mean to greet God? Like, what does it mean? Like, you know, we say hello to each other, like, what's happening? Like, what do you say to God? What does it mean? I'm greeting you, God. What does it mean? And he couldn't understand it. So he went through a whole bunch of scholars, like Imam Muhammad, who was one of the students of Imam Hanifa. And what does he mean? He's like, Tahiyya means Tahiyya. And then he went, and he got, no, it means something. He goes, no, it means Barakah. Then he said, what does Wabarakatuhu then mean? Why is the word Barakah used again? He goes, I don't know, it just means something. Just believe in it. And he was getting frustrated. So he went to Imam Shafi. Imam Shafi was a poet. And then Imam Shafi explained to him what the Tahiyya means. He says, these are the words that you're using. That we, because you're in the presence of the king of all kings. And in his presence, you're saying, any form of greeting that I can express, which reflects your benevolence, I'm associating and I'm saying it to you. That's what tahiyya means. Right? Tahiyya to Dillah, for Allah was salawat wa tayyibat. Salawat means, like, means prayer. Any form of prayer that we can ever in any way express belongs to Allah. Any part of our prayer belongs to Allah. We're doing it for the sake of Allah, whether you're fasting, counting your parents. Anything. Or tayyibat meaning anything that's pure. All the wholesome, pure things that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has created, <laughs> Allah is the one who's responsible for all of these things. And you re- you're reflecting over these ideas that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has created. Assalamu alaikum ayyuhan nabi. May God's blessing, special salamu alaikum. Allah saying here, may Allah's special salam be upon the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. Ayyuhan nabi. O Prophet, wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. And his special blessings and his mercy. You know, normal, you have, normal mercy is when Allah blesses you with something. Is rahmah. The exclusive, special mercy is salawat. You know, when somebody passes, I mentioned something deep here. When somebody passes away, we pray. What's that dua we pray? Inna lillahi wa inna ilayhi raji'un. We just like pray for the sake of praying. Why? In Baqarah, Allah even mentions, Alladina ila asabatum musibah. Those who have been inflicted with the difficulty, with the musibah, inflicted like a trial, difficulty, 
Danova, right? <laughs> How do you deal with that situation? These people say, to Allah we belong, and normal translation again, and to Him we will return, which is a mistranslation here. The real translation here, to Allah we belong, and to Him we are returning. Surajiun is active participle, it's a fa'al, meaning I'm returning to Him now. You know when you go to Asda and you put your shopping on the conveyor belt and it's going up to check out? That's how life is. You, every breath you take, every moment that passes, you're going closer to God. You're actually on that journey. You're not returning, not, gonna, not going to return to Him, you are returning to Him. Right? So that, that's what it means. And then Allah says that those people who say this, These are the people whose Allah's special exclusive mercy comes upon these people because they're so conscious and aware of Allah that every action reflects that belief. And we're asking for that salawat to be upon the Prophet The whole salawat ala nabi is, is that the whole idea of sending these special greetings of Allah. This is Allah's special mercy that He sends on people. And we can also... And then, وَعَلَىٰ إِبَادِ اللَّهِ الصَّالِحِينَ Allah says here, uh, Allah wants you to use these words, and He says, Allah also send your blessing on those who are righteous. Why this word is used? These words, the idea of mentioning righteous, is something which is aspirational for a believer. You have an aspirational target as a believer. Meaning, if you do what Allah tells you to do, then you will be included in the dua of every single person that prays on this earth, if you're from the Salihin. And, you, and all of the people who pray, and you class as a Salih, like a righteous, pious person, everyone who prays Salah is making dua for you. Their dua gets accepted, you get rewarded too. It's aspiration for a believer that my aim and objective in life is to be salih, to be righteous and to be conscious and aware of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And then it ends with the the shahud, uh, with the, the shahadu wa la ilaha illallah, shahadu wa Muhammad abduhu wa rasul, abba witness that there's only one Allah. And when you're saying this, you mean it, that's why you're putting your finger up. Right? You, you're saying this is one Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. I believe in the oneness of Allah. It's against a physical reflection and a manifestation of what's inside your iman. I believe in the oneness of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and I believe that the Prophet is his abd enslaved to him and worships him and his Rasul. I say every part is my favorite part of Salah. My second favorite part is then the Salawat upon the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam afterwards. So you're sending your durood upon the Messenger of Allah. Allahumma salli ala durood Ibrahim salli ala Muhammad wa ala Ali Muhammad. Allah send your Salawat again the salli, the special mercy upon the Prophet and his family, the Ahlul Bayt. I mean, you don't have to be Shia to love the Prophet's family. We love Ali radiallahu anhu, we love Ahl bayt we love Imam Hassan and Hussein, we love Fatima radiallahu anha. Ahl bayt are special people. It's mentioned in Hadith, in Bukhari and in Muslim. They ref- the Messenger of Allah refers to them as Ahl bayt We absolutely revere and love them. But Ali Muhammad is also his progeny. And he's saying, oh Allah, send your blessings upon the Prophet and his family, just the way you sent your blessing upon Ibrahim and his family. Why? Again, if I have a brief explanation. Ibrahim alayhi salam, his son is two sons. He had more than two sons, but these two sons. Ishaq and Ismail. Now, if you put Ishaq on this side, like the east side and the west side, put Ishaq here and Ismail there, all of the prophets of Banu Israel come from Ishaq alayhi salam. Ishaq alayhi salam's son is? Yaqub. Thank you. Awkward pause there. Right. He's Yaqub alayhi salam. Yaqub alayhi salam's son is? Yusuf as well as Yasbat, the rest of his siblings. From there came all of the Banu Israel prophets. Sulaiman Alaihislam, Dawud Alaihislam, Musa Alaihislam, Harun Alaihislam, and their Yazakri Alaihislam, Yahya Alaihislam. Their final prophet, who was the final prophet of Banu Israel? The Jew. Israel, let me explain what this is. Israel is another name for Yaqub. What is one of his names mentioned in the Quran? So Bani means children of Israel, I mean children of Yaqub Alaihislam. So my question is that, who's the last prophet then sent to Banu Ismail? No. Yeah, Isa. They did recognize him, but he, that was the last prophet. Isa alayhi salam was the last prophet sent to Banu Ismail. So, and he's coming from this side. The messenger of Allah doesn't come from that side. The messenger of Allah, remember when Ibrahim alayhi salam lives Hajar in the Arabia, Ismail, from there no descendants of prophets came, except the prophet sallallahu alayhi salam. So for us, Jesus is the penultimate prophet, but for Banu Israel, he's the final prophet, who the Jews don't even recognize, hence Christianity. But the idea here is that we believe that the Prophet is the final messenger. So why are we comparing the Ibrahim alayhi salam to the Prophet? It's because Ibrahim alayhi salam is like the father of the three Abrahamic faiths. 
And the Messenger of Allah is the conclusion, the culmination of all the traditions. And everyone in between is Al of, of Ibrahim. Everyone else is the family of Ibrahim alayhi salam. It's really cool. And Ibrahim alayhi salam, why? He's, he's an amazing prophet who went through so much tribulation and trial and difficulty. Right? Everyone, he had to leave his, his father because his father's manufacturing idols, man. Which is insane. Right? It's difficult for him. He went through dealing with his, his uh, leaving from one place to another, dealing with wife, so many situations, throwing him into the fire, dealing with Namrud. Allah held him in such high esteem, right? The whole notion of idea of even having to possibly even contemplate the idea of slaughtering your own child. We just talk about Eid al-Adha like, yeah, we just need new clothes and new chill. But the whole purpose is you do what God tells you to do. This is a human sacrifice Allah is asking him to do. The Jews believe it was actually Ishaq Islam mentioned in the Bible, in the Jewish Tanakh. But we believe it's Ismail Islam. Jews believe that it was actually Ishaq Islam who was supposed to be slaughtered where the dome of the rock in Jerusalem is. Where the, that's where they believe the temple was. We believe it's actually Ishaq, it's Ismail Islam in Arabia, close to Mecca, when you go on, on Hajj, the location which is the difference of understanding there. But the point is, so now we're saying, all the, all the focus and attention you give to Ibrahim Islam and his family, Allah send that kind of blessing plus more to the Prophet Sallallahu Why? Fast forwarded, really quick version. What makes the Prophet so special? I mean, he's born with his father, has passed away. By the age of six, his mother passes away. If you read about how his mother passes away, it's just insane. He has to bury his own mother. There's a hadith, I mean, you read the stuff, it's shocking. Right? He's passed into the custody of his grandfather, Abdul Muttalib. Grandfather passed away at the age of eight. Then he's moved on to the custody of his uncle, Abu Talib. Right? He's moved three, four primary care givers have passed away. I mean, psychologically, that can really affect you. Your confidence, how you forge relationships, trust issues. It creates so many issues, but the messenger Allah still continues. At the age of 12, the messenger Allah goes on his first trip to Syria with Abu Talib. In his youth, nothing much happened, uh, except that the messenger Allah was part of a treaty, like a convention, like an institution, in his late teens, 18, 19 years old. It's called the, like the treaty of the health of Fudayl, like, the, like the, the trust of virtue, the, the truce of virtue, where there was Abdullah bin Judan, who, people who are widowed and orphans and downtrodden, exploited people in society. A bunch of Meccans got together and said, you know what, we're going to help these people. It, when, and that time it was like a, like a dog eat dog kind of society where you just kind of exploit people, that's how you work. But, and the Messenger of Allah, even 20 years before Nabuwa, was so empathetic to his society that he was part of this. And even later on in Medina, he says, I would never, ever, ever replace my, me partaking in that particular oath or in that pledge or in that institution for anything in this world. Because the Messenger of Allah said, even before guidance, got to serve people. This is how the Messenger of Allah was. 25, he gets married to Lady Khadija. Khadija, radiallahu, amazing woman. You gotta listen, research her life. Amazing woman. He, she had the Prophet's back at all times. He had his beautiful children. By the age of 35, the whole story of the Kaaba, when he places the stone, I'm fast forwarding here, back into his area. He's known as Al Amin. Why? Because that communal trust, like we have Santander, NatWest, and all these banks where you leave, deposit your goods, they would have like a communal custodian where people could give their goods, and that person would be somebody who's trustworthy. The Prophet was the, 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 the youngest recipient of the honorific title of looking after people's stuff at the age of 35, calling him Al Amin. Messenger Allah now feels so affected by what's happening in society that he's struggling to deal with why girls are being buried alive, why women are seen. The Quran mentions this. I'll mention it in a simple way, but women had no value. Like, absolutely no. Women were seen as, as, as possession before Islam. And, and people would, you know, a man could marry as many women as he wanted. And the Quran mentions this in Surah Nisa. And Tarif Nisa Atarha. And a, a, a son would inherit his father's wealth as well as his father's wives, including his own mother, including incestual relationships. That's how insane, how morally deprived these people had become. Messenger of Allah can't deal with this, like what's happening here. It's so, people are drinking, gambling, exploiting the weak, having no ethics left. They had a few good things where they would be hospitable at times, but they would go to, to war with each other over anything. And the Messenger of Allah was so affected by what's happening, that he had to socially actually withdraw himself. That's where he's in Hira. The first chapter of Bukhari talks about Kitab, Bad al Wahi al Nabi. The first chapter discussing that the Prophet, uh, how revelation comes down to the Prophet. I mean, he's so affected. Imagine you're so annoyed and frustrated with your people, there must be more to life that you just like put everything aside. In terms of our human terms, 
The Messenger of Allah had an amazing wife. He had amazing children. He was financially stable. He had everything that we would think for somebody to be settled. But the Prophet didn't feel comfortable. And then revelation comes down. From the age of 40 for the next 23 years, literally the Prophet's life was flipped upside down, 180 all the way. Wait, from all of that stability came nothing but instability for the next 23 years. He's calling his people from Al Amin. Now they're calling. I'm, I'm mentioning all of this. Is why are we sending salawat upon the Prophet in salah? Right? You have to be connected to the seerah. Is whilst the Prophet is now calling his people, the same people who call him Al Amin, like you have like a hundred thousand Facebook likes and people like you. Now they're calling him crazy. You are crazy in the head. Literally, that, that's the words they're using. Messenger of Allah was hearing this so much times from the community, his own family members were telling him you're crazy. You know when everyone starts telling you crazy, you start thinking, am I crazy? <laughs> and then Surah Taha, ma anta bi ni'mati rabbika bi majnoon. You, O Messenger of Allah, are not insane. You are divinely inspired by God. They call him a soothsayer, a fortune teller. You connected with the jinns and the shayateen. The, the people of the New Testament have tutored you and taught you all of the scripture. You've just forged all the previous stuff. You're making the stuff. They couldn't have any explanation to this divine revelation and intervention. Rejection after rejection. The most weakest people like Bilal radiallahu are killed in, in front of him. You know, being persecuted and some were killed. Some slaves were killed. Sumayya radiallahu the first martyr of Islam. Right, he's seeing this. He, sells the, he, he sends them on political refuge. Think about, uh, during this time, the Messenger of Allah goes to Ta'if. Insane. Seventh, eighth time of year of, of, of our Islamic calendar. Not of Hijrah, before Hijrah. After Nabuwa. In absolute desperation, the Prophet has to find some political refuge. Not for himself, because he belongs to the Quraysh. It was like a gang mentality. That even though your people, people Quraysh didn't like the Prophet. He, Quraysh is a big clan, then you have sub-clans. He came from the Banu Hashim tribe. Right? Banu Umayya was another side of it. But because he came from that tribe, it's like his people didn't like him, but they wouldn't let anybody else harm the Prophet either. It's like that pride thing. You, know, you don't want to jump on us. If you do, then we're going to fight back. But we don't like what he's saying either. That's what was happening. At the end, his, his own tribe gave up on him. That's why the Prophet didn't have to seek refuge elsewhere. Why for the poor people? The ones who were really being exploited, like Khabab bin Arat radiallahu anh, talks about how he was put on coal. Right? His back was burnt. He showed that to the Prophet, the Messenger of Allah is crying. He said, please be patient. Something's going to happen for us. Right? The Messenger of Allah is in sujood in Mecca, in front of the Kaaba, and they put the, the afterbirth the placenta of a camel that has been slaughtered in the courtyard of the Kaaba onto the back of the Prophet. The fluid, the dirt. And all of them are laughing at the Prophet. Fatima Radiya, seven years old, she's crying. Why are they treating us like this? Imagine your kids seeing you do this. Right? You're, being, you're being disgraced in front of your own children. And he's dealing with rejection after rejection. We think Islamophobia is a new phenomena. The Quran is a historical recollection of Islamophobia. The Qur'an is a historical recollection of it. That's what the Prophet saw in the life is about. Struggle after struggle. When he seeks refuge, he goes to Taif, which is about 50 kilometers from Mecca. He's walking there. In this, he spends a few days there. The Banu Thaqif tribe, not only did they say no, they begin to stone the Messenger of God. Right? Somebody throws water balloons, you get annoying. Kids doing school. Stoning you. Literally getting stones and smacking you. The Messenger of Allah is losing so much blood that he's, he's almost out of being conscious. It was almost unconscious amount of blood that he was losing. Oxygen levels were going down. And Sayyid bin Harith the Allah is trying to cover and he's taking so many headshots. The Messenger of Allah almost passed out but was able to run. He's literally running for his life. We know the whole story, but we, don't, we have to really drag meaning to this when you say the salawat, even in your salah. And we know the story of the angel coming down. Angels like, you know what, these guys are between two mountains, but let's crush them, they're in the valley. The Messenger of Allah says, there's no need for this. Like, no, I don't want to exact revenge. Messenger of Allah is bleeding, finds him refuge under a tree, and then he makes the most amazing dua I have ever read in the seerah. This for me is the favorite. You can Google this dua. It's called the dua of Taif. He's, he's crying. He's bleeding. He tells the angels, just leave me alone. Like, I don't want to destroy these people. Maybe somebody from their family will accept Islam. Muhammad bin Qasim was from Taif who spread Islam in the Indian subcontinent. From Taif. 17 year old we are like the secondary benefactors of the dua of the prophet at taif for the asian community which is insane right and the messenger of allah makes the dua allahumma ilayka ashku dhu'fa quwwati wa qillati hilati wa hawani ala nas ya arham ar-rahimin 
O oh Allah, I complain to you about my lack of resources, my low societal standing. They don't recognize me. And my inability to propagate your message. Like, it's my fault that they're rejecting me. It's my fault. Right now, we can, we can blame all the Freemasons and all the people who are in charge of the media and all of these people. Like, when do we actually blame ourselves for the predicament we find ourselves in? Right? What have we done to contribute in the situation? The Messenger of Allah is so self-reflective that he's thinking about this. And he's saying, no, it's not them, it's me. Right? This is how self-reflective the Messenger of Allah is. The dua continues. And then he says, إِنَّ بِكُمْ بِي عَلِيَ غَضَبٌ فَلَا أُبَالِي Wallah, as long as you're not angry with me, I don't care how these people will treat me. Because I'm going to still continue. But if you bestow your grace upon me, I pray for it. Right? He's making this dua. He's making, this is the Messenger of Allah. You know, he goes to the... You know, in Medina, the Prophet was asked, what's the most difficult period of your life? He refers to two, part, two, two, in, two parts of his life. He said which was almost unbearable. He referred it to as Aam al Huzn. I, I done a, a, a tour on mental health in Islam. I just finished the tour in Ireland. And I was talking about mental health. The Messenger of Allah he said the most difficult time of my life, he actually said the year of depression. I was depressed that year. I'm talking about clinical depression, not just the word using the word I'm depressed. I'm actually depressed. Why? Because, because in Mecca they weren't able to preach and propagate. They excommunicated the Muslims. Like, you know, get out, no one's going to chill with you guys. No one's going to do any business with you. No one's going to allow you to marry any of us. No one's going to even talk to you. And imagine if this happened, hypothetically, like in Luton, the government passed, where well, the council said, you know, all the Muslims, all your possessions, everything's gone, go live in your local park. The only canopy and roofing you have is the sky. So this is what happens to the Prophet. And in that situation, that's hard enough to deal with. And the Sahaba talk about them eating leaves to stay alive. But in that time, his wife passes away. This was so hard for the Prophet to deal with. The, the woman who had his back has left him. And she was not to see what's going to happen in Medina now. And the Messenger of Allah was crying. It affected him so much. To such an extent, even in Medina, right after the Battle of Badr, right, her, her, his daughter is married to somebody who was opposing and fighting the Prophet Wasallam. So the Messenger of Allah is ransoming some of these prisoners. And his own daughter from Mecca sent a necklace that her mother Khadija had given to her on her wedding. And the Messenger of Allah sees this and he breaks down in tears. Just looking at a necklace. Because he reminded him of Lady Khadija. The Messenger of Allah would be so hospitable just to her friends because he reminded him of his wife. That's how much he, this is hard for the Prophet. And then his uncle passed away. Abu Talib passes away. The father of Ali radiallahu anh. And he left without Iman. He died without Iman. Allah had to reveal to the Prophet, you don't guide man ahbabta. You don't guide who you love. Allah guides who He wishes. This is so hard for the Prophet. Somebody who supported him is not dying without Iman. And you think, okay, fine, in Medina the Prophet was chilling, like, it's okay. It's even more difficult. The challenges were just different. 13 years of Mecca, now in 10 years of Medina, the next, to, next decade of his life. Every battle in Islam, remember this, post 53, right? When the Messenger was going into Badr, Badr He's a 53, 54-year-old man, right? I mean, like, like 28, man, my leg's broken, <laughs> right? I can't even stand properly, right? I think that those who went to boxing, Bernard Hopkins, uh, 46, won the WBC light heavyweight champion. That's just 12 rounds, right? Imagine going to battle. Every battle was fought post-50. And the messenger will last to do this. And he's doing this for the, to secure his enemy's salvation, not because he wants land or property or influence or power, or he was a supremacist. He's doing this for the people, right? I mean, the Quran revelation, right? He's, 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 he's now he's become a statesman in Medina. He's signing, he has a foreign policy. He's signing treaties with the communities, receiving delegations, dispatching armies. He's dealing with multiple wives. Monogamy is a challenge. Polygamous relationships, insane, right? The Messenger of Allah is struggling. The Quran talks about this. The Messenger of Allah is struggling to deal with his multiple wives. The Quran actually talks about this in detail. Right? Imagine your line manager is God, right? and your appraisal is the Qur'an, and you're being exposed till the end of time for anything that you slip up on. And God's telling him, This is your warning. If you don't do the job, you failed. The Messenger of Allah says, It's the most difficult <laughs> verse I've ever received. Allah's telling me, if I'm not doing my job properly, then I've failed. It's, it's, this is difficult. Right? He's, he's receiving wahi, he's helping the widows, he's the imam, 
he's, he's dealing with the hypocrites, he's dealing with the ones who are opposing him, he's dealing with the armies who are trying to kill him, the same people of Quraysh. The Muslims are also affecting the Prophet, the Bedouins, who were not too cultured. They were harming the Prophet And after he's done this whole thing, he sleeps for a short while and then he stands all night in Qiyamul Layl in Tahajjim. فَإِذَا فَرَغْتَ فَانْصَبْ When you finish your stuff, when you farigh, like when you finish the stuff in, with people, spend some one-on-one -on -one time with Allah until his feet will become swollen. This is the Messenger of Allah. And when you mean Salah, this is what we're thinking about who, why are we sending the special mercy? Because the Messenger of Allah deserves this mercy. And, and the Messenger of Allah says by invoking mercy upon the Messenger of Allah, 10 of our sins get forgiven. And we get, 10, we get promoted 10 steps in paradise, higher position in paradise. This is what we're thinking about. And then the end of the Salah is the dua. You can pray any dua normally you want, but most likely we pray that Allah may have to nafsi adhalam kathira. Wallah, I've oppressed myself. Why have you oppressed yourself? You may, you're saying this in your dua. Why have you oppressed yourself? Allah says in the Quran, وَمَا ظَلَمُهُمُ اللَّهُ وَلَكِنْ كَانُوا أَنفُسَهُمْ يَظْلِمُونَ Allah does not oppress people, but people oppress themselves. Like, what kind of insane weirdo would oppress themselves? Right? Why? It's because when you break God's commandments, you subjugate yourself to His punishment. You know, if you're driving, now we get six points, double the fine. Right? When the police stop you, you are on the phone when you're not supposed to. You punished yourself. When people disobey God, they're punishing themselves. They'll pay the price. So Allah says, you say, Allah, Rabbana, dhalamna anfusana. This is also the dua of Adam alayhi salam. Very similar wording. When he was sent down to this earth. Rabbana, dhalamna anfusana. Allah, I've oppressed myself. Wa ilam taqfir lana wa tarhamna lanakuna namun al-khasirin. The dua of Adam alayhi salam. Allah, if you don't forgive me and overlook my mistakes, I'm doomed. Khasirin literally means I'm lost. I'm, I'm, in, I'm amongst the losers. Dhalamna nafsi, dhalman kathir. Allah, I've oppressed myself so much. Fafidli walhamni the dua continues, Allah forgive me and have mercy upon me. And you're asking Allah. And then you ending your salah with salah on each side. And the dua that the Prophet would pray after salah, Allahumma anta salam wa minka salam tabarak yad al jalal wa ikram. There's a sahabi who was praising Allah. And he said, Oh Allah, may peace be upon you. He sings salah salam to Allah. So the Messenger was listening to him. And then the Messenger of Allah said to him, no, no, there's no such thing as saying salam to Allah because whoever can confer a blessing upon God must be greater than God. So no, say this instead. Wallah, you are the source of peace and from you comes peace. This is the dua. Allahumma anta salam wa minka salam. You are the embodiment of peace and from you comes peace. So send us peace. Right? And, and, and then you're doing the athqar. You know, the, fa the, the tasbih of Fatima radiallahu anha. 33 times subhanallah again you're thinking of how exalted and how perfect Allah is 33 times alhamdulillah and you're thinking about everything that you have the, the fact that you woke up the fact that you're praising Allah you had food to drink you have oxygen you're in good health you th this is what you think about it's not just a verbal utterance going through a tasbih it's actually thinking right that's why in the qiyamah it's actually weight your actions are weight or, or, or how heavy your actions are not necessarily of just I've done so much or accumulated because each action holds particular merit to it. So it's not just going through 33 times, it's about what did each one of those 33 times mean to you? And then you say, Allah Akbar 34 times. Now imagine you do this five times a day. The Prophet says, he said this hadith, you probably heard it before. He mentioned in Bukhari and in Muslim. But the Messenger of Allah says, if somebody wants to bathe five times a day, some of us go to gym, right? You take a shower afterwards, probably take a shower in the morning, it gets like... The Messenger of Allah says, imagine somebody bathes five times a day. Like you hit the shower five times a day, or you live next to a stream and you bathe five times. Would this person be dirty? And the Sahab said, of course not. Because this is the example of somebody who's spiritually malnourished, but he prays. There's no, there's no way he can be sinful. Because Allah forgives him. Why? Because he doesn't, he's so aware of not committing the sin in the first place. Because he's conscious of what he said in his salah. And any kind of slip-ups he's made, as a result of his salah, has been forgiven to him. That's what salah is. Right? This is a really short version of it, but there's so much for us to explore and understand. Some of the stuff that I would maybe, ex I would really, teach you, right? I can't have to give you homework to ruin your guys' free time. Just a quick few points. Oops, sorry. Is what can you do now? Right? These lectures are just like a iman booster thing. But what are you supposed to practically do? I'm gonna give you guys some tips. Again, you guys catch me on Facebook. Is what's my name? Not that. It's my Sheikh Abdul Hamid. That's on Facebook. You can message me directly. You can. I'll, I'll put these links up in my previous talks too. But what can you do? I want everyone here to study the Fatiha again, and I'll explain to you how you're going to do it. This is for this one year. 
do this during Ramadan, you'll love it. Like Taraweeh won't be like a burden. The word Taraweeh comes from the Raha, which means like to chill out. <laughs> Taraweeh for us is like, they have a punishment. Right? For, it's supposed to be like the chill out thing. Like you know how you play FIFA 17 and stuff? You can't play that. Right? <laughs> or you know people watch like Netflix and people listen to the Salah thinking about Harvey Specter, if Mike makes the bar or not, or Pablo Escobar from Narcos, or Bobby Axelrod from Billions. All right, oh, what's happening in EastEnders or oh, Coronation Street? Like, that's what happens in our salah. That's what we think about. What's going to happen now? What, did I do one more cook next? What's going to happen? That's why our salah, because you're not focusing on what you're saying. So, everyone's homework here. Yeah? Do this for one whole year. You need to stand on the Fatiha, and I want you to study the last 10 surahs of the Quran, and I'll explain how. Your aim is to study the Fatiha because we recite it 17 times a day in our fourth salah, and the last 10 surahs from Surah Field to Surah Nas. Most likely, we pray those surahs, that's right. Right? The Jewish and stuff is obviously important, but meaning is more important. How? I'll give you some tips. Number one, use two. You can use any tafsir that you want, but tafsirs which possibly you may prefer using because they've been translated well in English. Most number one most commonly used is Ibn Kathir. So say, I'm, for example, I want to explore the Fatiha. I'm gonna take one month to just focus on each surah. Should take you about a month, right? So eleven months in total, and then plus revising over it, and then it's working through the Quran slowly. So use Ibn Kathir. Now, if you don't want to buy the books, it's a tafsir book. Then there's a website that you can use. It's called Q Tafsir. Letter Q Tafsir dot com. Q the letter Q Tafsir dot com. It has the whole Ibn Kathir. If you go on Fatiha, it'll actually go point by point and explain the tafsir to you. That's one resource you use. You can use anything else, but in English, not many have been translated. Ma'arif al Quran has been translated. Ma'arif al Quran by Mufti Shafi Uthmani, Mufti Taqi Uthmani's father. A Pakistani chief, chief justice, amazing scholar. Ma'arif al Quran is called Ma'arif al Quran. You can Google this stuff. M A A R I F U L. Ma'arif al Quran. Use both. So you're using Ibn Kathir, using Ma'arif al Quran. You read the translations and you read the tafsir. You have your notebook. This is not passive learning, this is active learning. Where you take about 20 minutes to half an hour, three times a week, spiritually, hence what my students call. Right, you want to be on a spiritual diet, right? You want to, 20 minutes to, th just, that's it, don't do too much because you overexert yourself that you can't commit, right? Two to three times a week where you are spending reading the Fatiha, Ma'arif al Quran ibn Kathir. Then, I'm sure you guys probably heard of Bayna TV and Naman Ali Khan, and he has some amazing stuff. My, my teacher in uh, Leicester, he, Sheikh Riyad al Haq, probably heard of him, I'm not sure if you have. He has also the whole Juz Amma on YouTube. Surah by Surah. His name is Sheikh Riyad al-Haq. Amazing British scholar. Really knowledgeable. I mean, amazing. Uh, either listen to Ustad Rahman or listen to Sheikh Riyad or anyone who you enjoy listening to. Anyone. Like somebody who you know is legit. Anyone listen to. You can download some podcasts. So it's audio-visual learning. So you're writing it, you're reading it, and you're listening to it and watching it. That's how you retain. That's the only way you can retain stuff. Right? And then you're going through your notes. And then you explore and then you focus and then you practice that in your salah you know before you go into the ring you go on the bags you're sparring you're doing on your rounds before you go you're simulating it your nawafid in your sunnah is simulating your fard right before every fard there's a sunnah including maghrib malik opinion like if you go to Arab countries in Regent's Park and Mosque in London after maghrib they actually pray to surakah sunnah Hanifi understanding is that it's not sunnah but there are others who do believe it why is it? because before you do the main course you have your starters you get into the zone Right? I need to get there, be switched on, and then when I go into the fard, I need to focus. How are you going to practice this? Is pray some nawafil, genuinely do this, and see how many times you get distracted in, 12, in, in two rakats. In two rakats, see how many times, and keep note, this is just like practice. Pray your naf nafil. When I done this with my ustad in my third year when I was studying, <laughs> I daydreamed 12 times. I was like, what the heck are you thinking about yourself? Right? This is after studying everything, I'm still daydreaming. And then obviously you have to practice at it. Right? Try to be conscious, try to be aware, think about new things in your salah. Think about that, that whole point is that the more Quran you understand, the more you have to think about it. And it kind of connects you. Right? And the more things you have to that's the whole purpose of salah. I done the same thing with my students. So we got 13, 14 year olds, and we gathered them, we done the whole 10 surahs with them, the Fatiha. And I said, okay, right, write all your stuff down, we practice two rakats. So we, we all pray two rakats, and then we had a sheet of paper, and we had to write the stuff down. So one kid said, I was distracted 13 times. I was like, you a bigger shaitan than me, man, 13 times. That's insane. What the heck were you thinking about? And this is like a few years ago. So he goes, 
he mentioned the same point three times. He goes, who killed Lucy Beale? <laughs> on EastEnders, he goes, that's what I'm thinking about. <laughs> but at least he's being truthful. And you're aware that that's what you're thinking about. And then, what should you be thinking about? Okay, this one I need to focus on. This, this, it, takes, it takes effort. That's why in the Quran, when Allah's condemning, you know the worst people, even people who are lower than Fir'aun in hell, are the hypocrites, the munafiqeen. And when Allah's describing them in the Quran, Allah says, وَإِذَا قَامُوا إِلَى الصَّلَاةِ قَامُوا كُسَالَةِ When they stand up for prayer, they pray in this kasla, like really lazy, like, oh my God, it's end time, I have to pray. And I don't really want to pray, but because everyone around me is praying, I have to do it. People will think I'm weird. Whether I have wudu or not, God does. Right? And I just pray. يُرَاءُونَ nas Like ostentatiously. You're only praying because your partner is forcing you, your parents are forcing you, your friends are forcing you, or just their social pressure is forcing you. وَلَا يَذْكُرُونَ اللَّهَ إِلَّا قَلِيلًا These words, listen to this. Allah says that they only remember God a little in their prayer. And the verse continues where Allah says, فِي asfal min nar That these people will be in the lowest pits of hell. And Allah has seen that the hypocrites are remembering God but not enough compared to us being absent-minded. Right? It's a huge thing. It's a huge thing. If somebody is deprived from the benefit of salah, I think you've been deprived from all good in life. And I'm not, I'm not sitting here thinking I'm some kind of high horse because I know all this stuff. I struggle with it all the time, honestly. I mean, there's times I pray where I think, man, I haven't prayed properly. I need to do that stuff again. I need to pray my salah again. I have to do it sometimes. Right? I just don't feel like I prayed properly. Take your time. Right? Think about it. Your salah takes you four or five minutes. Six minutes max. Right? Four, five times a day. Do it. And build that relationship. Repair to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Inshallah. If you guys have any, any quick questions, then we'll conclude the session. About what we discussed before some random topics. Anybody have any questions about salah or something that I discussed or not too sure about? No? You guys, if you have any questions, hit me up on Facebook. Inshallah. Jazakallah. Wa akhirat da'wana. Alhamdulillah. Rabbil alameen.